speaker this morning is our brother Philip Tomlin. He's here with his wife April. He is from Kennedy, Alabama. Uh, Philip is a great leader. He's a great student. He's a great friend. And I know that we can all benefit from the lesson this morning. The title of his sermon is Be Ye Holy, for I am holy. Come speak to us, brother. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. God is the high and lofty one who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Isaiah 57, 15. God is holy. And it is this holiness that will be the basis of our study together this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles to the passage that was just read in our presence, 1 Peter chapter 1. And our text will be verses 13 through 16. Holy is defined by Thayer as being set apart for the service of God. Also, in a moral sense, pure, upright, sinless. Webster adds, characterized by perfection and transcendence commanding absolute adoration and reverence. God is holy. We understand that. We associate holiness with God. But the inspired apostle tells us that we too are to be holy. In our time together this morning, let us examine this commandment to be holy as God is holy. And in so doing, we'll consider three thoughts. One that will be holy as God is holy will, number one, loathe sin. Number two, he will love souls. And number three, he will live like the Savior. In the first place this morning, notice that one who will be holy as God is holy will loathe sin. The Bible defines sin for us. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. All unrighteousness is sin, 1 John 5, 17. To sin is to miss the mark, to offend, to do wrong, and thus to bear guilt. The first step in our becoming holy as God is holy is for us to understand the enormity and the heinousness of sin. This is a difficult task, for our minds cannot fully fathom just how horrible sin truly is. The only way for us to begin to understand the horrors of sin is for us to observe the punishment that God has deemed necessary for sin. God is infinite in love, he's infinite in mercy, and he's infinite in compassion. And yet sin is so awful and so disgusting that his perfect sense of justice has constrained him to punish it, as we see in Scripture. God has decreed that the price which must be paid for sin is death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Whereas by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5.12. Perhaps you are thinking, Death is too harsh of a punishment for sin. Perhaps if you or I were the judge of all the earth, we would not have passed down such a verdict. That is just a testament to the fact that you and I, as those who have been guilty of sin, don't fully understand the nature of it. God understands sin, and he abhors it. He hates it, and he expects us to do the same. The Bible contains the record of God's teaching man how dreadful sin really is. 
Sin caused man to be banished from the Garden of Eden. Sin was responsible for God's destroying all but eight members of the human race in a global flood. Fire rained down from heaven, consuming Sodom and Gomorrah, and sin was to blame. Millions upon millions of animals were slaughtered on the Jewish altar because of sin. It was because of Israel's sin that God allowed his people to be taken into captivity. And it was sin that nailed God's precious, sinless son to a cross. Not his sin, but ours. For Christ also hath once suffered four sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being quickened by the Spirit, 1 Peter 3.18. Sin is responsible for all the death and all the pain and all the sorrow for all humanity for all time. It is no wonder then that God loathes sin, and he insists that we do the same. Ye that will love the Lord, hate evil, Psalm 97.10. Hate the evil and love the good, Amos 5.15. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, Romans 12.9. God is holy, and so too must we be. We must loathe sin. But in the next place this morning, consider that one who is holy, as God is holy, will love souls. And the Lord God created man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, Genesis 2-7. And as such, each person whom we encounter on a daily basis possesses an immortal soul. Each one of us here in attendance this morning will live somewhere for all eternity. God loves each individual soul, and we must do likewise. And in order for us to love souls as we should, we must first understand and appreciate the value of a soul. Jesus asked, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Each one of us here this morning knows that verse. And I'm convinced that each one of us believes it to be true. But do our lives reflect that? Do our words reflect this truth? How often have we been guilty of making a statement like this? Well, I preached at the so-and-so congregation out in the country this morning. There were only 12 people there. Or perhaps someone asks us, well, how did your mission trip go? And we reply, well, I'm afraid we didn't do much good. We were there for three months, and we only baptized one person. You see the inconsistency with these statements compared to what God has said about the value of just one soul. Luke 15, 7 says, There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Do we share that joy with God? Does our heart break for the one who doesn't repent? For the one who enters eternity lost? God's does. If everyone in this room dedicated themselves wholly to preaching the gospel and trying to reach the lost, if everyone in this room worked tirelessly for 16 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of our lives, and the sum total, the cumulative effect of all of our labor was that just one soul who would have otherwise been lost is now saved, then all of our efforts are well worth it. If all of us work the rest of our lives and just one soul is saved as a result of our efforts, that is an outstanding return on our investment. That is the value of a soul. The first man, Adam, sinned, and all men who have come since followed suit. But suppose for just a moment that were not the case. Suppose that Adam did not sin, and that all who came after him all through the ages lived perfectly sinless lives. 
until you. Suppose that no man ever committed a single sin on this earth until you came along. And then ask yourself this question. Would God have still sent his only begotten son to this earth just for you? Would Christ have still gone to the cross and suffered that horrible death just for you? Knowing what we know about the value of a soul and how God loves souls and how he desires for us to be reconciled to him, the answer is absolutely, yes, he would. And what a powerful thought. What a sobering thought. What a humbling thought. With the value of just one soul in mind, consider this aspect of the definition of the word holy, that is to be set apart for the service of God. Christians are saints. We are sanctified by definition. That is, we are set apart for the service of God. So what is this service for which we have been set apart? Or we might ask it in this way, what is our commission? And of course we know our commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. This is our service. We are the medium through which God will reach the lost. This is our task. This is our commission. God loves souls. He was already shown what he is willing to sacrifice in order to save them. Now the question is, what am I willing to give up in order to reach the lost? What am I willing to sacrifice in order to help save a lost soul? If I am to be holy as God is holy, I must love souls the way that he does. And then finally, this morning, one who is holy as God is holy will live like the Savior. Jesus had just told his apostles that he was going to prepare a place for them and that he would come again and receive them unto himself, John 14, 1 through 6. And in verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been with you so long time, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Jesus is God. Jesus is the brightness of his, that is the Father's, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Hebrews 1.3. Jesus was the epitome of holiness. He was pure and upright and sinless. Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2.22. Jesus, who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. Jesus, of whom it was said, in him is no sin, 1 John 3.5. Jesus was set apart for the service of God. More accurately, Jesus set himself apart for the service of God. He said, I do always those things which please him, that is the Father, John 8.29. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Matthew 20.28. 20, Jesus is God. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is perfect in his holiness. He is the one whom Isaiah saw sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. John 12.41. And yet Jesus came to this earth and died a cruel death for you and for me. Jesus died for us and instead of us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. 
Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasure. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to bear. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. As Christians, we are priests. As Christians, we are saints. We have been set apart for God's holy service. And as such, may we endeavor to be holy as he is holy. May we loathe sin, love souls, and live like the Savior.